This lecture is going to focus on victimology and the sociology of victimization. So we're going to look first of all at what we mean when we talk about a victim and the definitions and quantification of the term victim. We're going to look at patterns of victimization according to class, age, gender and ethnicity and sexuality. The impact that victimization can have on a person. And finally, we'll be looking at theories of victimization. What causes somebody to be a victim of crime? So, as I said, we, we first of all need to understand what it is we mean when we talk about a victim. Now, the general definition, accepted definition, comes from the United Nations, and it is a person who suffers physical, mental, or psychological harm, economic loss or impairment of their rights through acts or omissions that violate the laws of the state. So when we're talking about a victim, we are talking about somebody who has had has been impacted by criminal activity. So that could be directly. So you could have been the person that was robbed. So it could have been your house that was broken into or even indirectly. So the family members, friends of a murder victim, for example, a murder victim doesn't really the only impact a murder victim will have is the loss of life. But for the families of the victims, uh, for the friends of the victims, um, there, there is a wider um, impact for them. So with, when talking about victims, we are talking about those who are impacted by criminal activity in a negative way. Okay, I don't think anyone would say that there's a a victim would be would see criminal activity in a positive light. Um, so this is the definition we're going to use, and going forward, anyone who has been negatively impacted physically, psychologically, emotionally, economically, or in any terms of their human rights through criminal activity. So let's look at the views of crime victims, what it is that the characteristics of crime victims. Now, when we look at this, we look at this in three different ways. We look at it as a traditional kind of stereotypical view of a victim of crime. Um, we can look at the media view of the victim of crime and how they portray victims of crime to look like. And then we'll look at what the stats actually tell us. And it is a very different story in each case. So, for example, we'll start with a traditional view. A traditional view of a victim of crime is somebody who is weak, innocent, blameless and vulnerable. So when you've been a victim of crime, it's generally seen as you're the hard done by party. You're um beyond reproach because you were the innocent party that was hard done by but the media takes a slightly different view they see they tend to portray victims as being female white middle class and innocent this is often referred to as missing white woman syndrome so and we'll look at this a bit more when we look at media and crime but when the crimes that are reported in the um, newspapers and in the press tend to, to use victims who are um, female, white, middle class and innocent because they're, they, they put across a certain message um, that the mainstream media is trying to get across. However, statistically, if we look at uh, the statistics regarding victimology, a victim you are more likely to be a victim of a crime if you are male between the ages of 19 and 28 and from an ethnic minority so that looking at these views you can see that they are very different ideas on who is and who can be a victim of crime the media very much is portraying a false view um of the victims of crime, of who can be a victim of crime, because it plays well in the media. You can get some really nice pictures of of white middle class white women with their families, and aren't they wonderful? And she was a soccer mom type person, whereas a 19 to 28 year old ethnic minority male doesn't quite get the same level of sympathy. 
and the idea that victims of crime are weak kind of plays into the idea that perhaps they they brought it on themselves they did something wrong um to bring the crime on themselves but they're not to blame for the actual crime they put themselves in that that vulnerable situation but they're not to blame for themselves so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the trends and the patterns of victimization within class age ethnicity and sexuality and see how how those um social structures play into probability of being a victim or um, not as the case may be so let's start with social class now i've used the the terms poor middle class and rich because that was the picture i could find um, but we are actually thinking more along the lines of working class, middle class and upper class. So the poor or the working class are more likely to be a victim of crime. Now, if you remember back to when we were talking about crime control and prevention, um, this could be because they are the ones who can't afford the bars, bolts and barriers. They, they, they can't afford to, um, they are more likely to be easy pickings if you like um, we can also link into here about the idea of focal concerns and the idea that um, the working class have the, their focal concerns which tend to be more about aggressiveness and hyper masculinity place people who are working class in more likely to be a position of um, assault or robbery and things like that however the middle class are more likely to fear being a victim of crime. So they're not actually more likely to be a victim of crime, probably because they can afford the bars, bolts and barriers and they can afford the protections um, for their material goods and for their own safety. But thanks to the media's portrayal of victims of crime, it is more likely that they are going to fear being a victim of crime even though the statistics don't back up the idea that they're more likely to be the victim. And finally, the, the upper class, the rich, are more likely to report a crime compared to any other social group. And they're also more likely to have that crime investigated. Now, if you remember again, when we were looking at measuring crime, we talked about police triage and how they um, determine which case, which crimes are going to be report uh, recorded and investigated in which ones they kind of go well nah, not really worth our time one of the factors there was the status of the victim and the higher the status of the victim the more likely they are to have their crime investigated and have police resources um, allocated to their crime because they have connections they have it's not again it's not what you know it's who you know um and if you're friends at the golf club with someone high up in the police force or politicians or members of high standing within the community that puts pressure on the police and they they're kind of so it kind of works in that way of the the more higher your status in society the richer you are the more likely you are to have your crime report uh, recorded and investigated so to summarize working class are more likely to be a victim of crime the middle class are more likely to fear being the victim of a crime but not actually the victim and the work and the upper class are the most likely to report the crime and have that crime investigated regardless of what the crime is now you will remember that when we did talk about measuring crime things like murder are always going to be reported and recorded and um, investigated but things like um, property damage robbery um, things like that perhaps sometimes people will think well it's not worth reporting because they're not going to investigate or the police decide that it's not worth their time to investigate if we then look at victimizations over age I do apologize for the 100% male picture but it was the best one I could find um, in terms of victimization of age what the statistics tell us is that infants are most at risk of being murdered now there is slight um, controversy here because with infants 
Um, obviously, there is a, a chance of, of being murdered, but sometimes those murders can be um, misconstrued as maybe sudden infant death syndrome. Um, but infants are so vulnerable and reliant upon adults and others to, to maintain their health and maintain their life that they are the most at risk of being murdered. Teens are most likely to be the victims of violence, sex, crime and theft. So as we saw with the statistical model of um, views of victimology, between the ages of 19 and 28 is the highest likelihood of being a victim of crime. Now that could be to do with the lifestyles that people lead during that age range, um, the behaviours that people demonstrate where they're trying to find themselves, they're more likely to be part of a subculture at that age, um, impressionable to peers and um, media. So it's at that age that picture uh, we are most likely to be victim victimized. Um, but the elderly are more like most likely to be victims of abuse and particularly in terms of um, familial abuse of neglect not so much sexual abuse but it does happen but um, neglect um, financial abuse as well um, there's actually quite a good film on Netflix at the moment called um, I care a lot where a woman um, manage, gets placed as guardian of various elderly people. She puts them in a home and then sells off everything she own, they own for her own profit, which is criminal. But because she has power of attorney, she's allowed to do it. Um, because she's saying she's selling it to pay for the home. I do recommend it. It's quite good. It's a very good film with Rosamund Pike. Um, but the elderly are more likely to be victims of abuse. But the middle aged middle age range, the uh, 30 to 50 age range, they're most likely to, to fear being a victim of crime. Again, it's at this point that you have things that you care about, material goods, cars, homes. You have other people to consider. So you might have family, you might have children of your own. Um, so age, the general trisk trend is that the risk of victimization does decrease with age, but it depends on what sort of crime you're looking at. Okay. In terms of gender, as we know from the statistics, men are more at risk of being victims of violent crime. In the UK, around 70% of homicides are male victims. Um, and we, we know from our study of gender and crime with the masculinity theory that men are more likely to get into physical altercations, which could lead to assault, um, GBH, murder. Um, they're also more likely to be in situations where the criminal activity could take place. If you think, remember, we talked about bedroom culture and um, the um, women's control over women's time and space. So men are more at risk of being victims of violent crime. They're also more likely to be victims of personal crime, i.e. victims against uh, crimes against the person. Whereas women are more likely to be at risk of sex related crimes. Now, this obviously is linked to the definitions of sex crime. For example, men in the UK can't get raped legally. It would be sexual assault because rape is defined as penile penetration without consent. Um, so a man can rape a man, but a woman can't rape a man. Um, but also um, men, we, we know that men are physically stronger and bigger than women that's a there's a biological fact generally and um, there are always exceptions to the rule which can lead to um women feeling more vulnerable and being more vulnerable to sexual offenses they're also more likely to be victims of domestic violence although we are starting to see a change in that now, if you remember back to 
families and households where they were pointing out that um, there are more and more men coming forward as victims of domestic assault, uh, domestic violence, not just um, homosexual men, but straight men as well. And um, this, the, these abusive situations have been happening for a long time, but men wouldn't report them because they didn't want to seem, uh, seem weak or vulnerable to the police or didn't even think they would be believed. How, how can a woman be up a man? How can a woman be abusive and violent towards a man? It, that's kind of mentality. But we are seeing change and we are seeing more and more men coming forward um, as victims of domestic violence. We are seeing more um, cases where women are taken to court for domestic violence offences. Prior to her death, Caroline Flack was um, prosecuted under domestic violence laws against her boyfriend. Um, and women are more likely to be trafficked. And again, that could be to do with physicality and women are easier to subdue and um, keep control of compared to men. But in general, when we're looking at trends in gender and crime, men are more likely to be a victim of crime, but not when it comes to sex crimes, domestic violence or trafficking. With regards to ethnicity, we've already pointed out that ethnic minority males are more likely to be a victim of crime, but ethnic minorities are in general are at more at risk of being a victim of crime, particularly those who are of mixed ethnicity. Um, and this could be because they're seen as different um, and not part of a particular group. Um, but also, the Home Office has estimated there are around 300 hate crimes a day. Now, since 9-11 in 2001, that that um, the amount of hate crime that has um, been reported is going up. Um, victims are more likely to report hate crimes in terms of racial hate um, now than they were before. And after the McPherson report and the reports on institutional racism, the police forces are trying to appear more, um, what's the word? can't remember, brain's gone. Um, the police are trying to show that they are taking these reports more seriously. And when it comes to a hate crime, it is the victim that determines whether or not that it was a hate crime. If they felt that they were being victimized because of their ethnicity, their race, their gender, their sexuality, um, that all, it, it's not the perpetrator, it's the victim. So if racial slurs are used, that would turn a, um, an assault into a hate crime. Um, if certain language is used or if there's a history of harassment from the perpetrator to the victim, that can all inst be, be used as evidence that this was a hate crime rather than a non-hate crime. Which brings us on to sexuality. In 2018-2019, 88.1% of all hate crimes in the UK were linked to sexual orientation and 0.3% were link linked to transgenderism. Okay, So we, we separate out transgenderism from sexuality because sexuality and sexual orientation is who you are attracted to. Transgenderism links to your gender identity. So when it comes to being a victim of a hate crime a uh, that's based to gender identity or sexuality, men tend to receive more homophobic um, crimes against them, in particular harassment and distress, maybe um, the way that people react around them. Um, friends of mine who are um, gay men and they have a beautiful little boy that they adopted they've been accosted in the street and told that they shouldn't be allowed to have a child that they're going to turn the child gay um, and things like that and this is in front of the child and that although that's not harassment because it's a one-off offence it is distressing 
both for the for them and for their child um and that can be reported to the police it will be reported it will be logged um probably wouldn't be maybe the person might have a uh, the police might have a word with them but it wouldn't probably go on more than that until it became a harassment issue or it escalated into violence with um women it tends to be more transphobic um and trans women get far more uh, abuse um, and assault compared to trans men or um, gay or lesbians um, and the perpetrators do tend to still be middle class middle class white sorry not middle class working class white men aged between 39 and 50. now this could be partly due to um, their upbringing, their socialisation, um, the lack of acceptance for that generation. They would have been the section, what we call Section 28 generation, where they, they wouldn't have had um, discussions of homosexuality or transgenderism or anything like that when they were at school. It was actually illegal to discuss those things when they were at school even when I was at school um oh god I'm actually in that age range now um <laughs> I've just realized that so it is um something that tends to be the perpetrators of sexuality based um hate crimes do tend to come more from men than they come from women okay but this also shows us that there is a social construction to victimization and to victimology okay um and what we mean by that is who is a victim isn't just determined by that definition that we had from the united nations the, there are other factors which can influence the labeling of somebody as a victim so for example if you don't report the crime you can't use the label you can't be given the label of victim so all those factors that we talked about in terms of measuring crime will play will, will still apply here in terms of the label applying that label of victim victim to somebody um if they don't if you're scared of um repercussions if you don't trust the police all of those things will mean that you won't report the crime to the police without reporting the crime you're not a victim of a crime because um there's no th th there's no record of it and it could be argued that you're not accepting that the crime has occurred which links into the next po bullet point of victims who don't know that they're victims of crime like the example that we've used in the past of losing your wallet in town did you lose it were you pickpocketed um were you or did you just lose it did it did you just put it down somewhere and, and not know where it's gone but again if you don't know you're a victim of a crime you can't pick up that label of being a victim the refusal or acceptance of the label there are some people who particularly with sexual assaults and sexual based crimes where the victim will be i am not a victim i am a survivor and that change in terminology because when we use the word victim it, it, it brings up um those traditional views those stereotypes of weak vulnerable innocent which then lead us to believing that they need to be protected um so for some victims of crime they will say i am not a victim i am a survivor or I am not a victim, this thing happened to me, it does not shape me. So just like when we were looking at labelling theory and we discussed um, the negotiation process and the self-fulfilling prophecy, that can still be applied here in terms of the label of victim. So some people will say, I am not a victim, whereas others will take that label internalize it and internalize those traditional characteristics and that becomes who they are i am a victim of crime and they that becomes a key part of who they are 
You've also got the denied label of the victim. And this again links back to um, kind of the police triage element that we were talking about in terms of measuring crime and the reporting of crime. Certain victims are denied their victimhood. So people, uh, prostitutes, um, homeless, drug addicts, people on the margins of society are often de denied that label of being a victim. And a good example here is the um, Yorkshire Ripper. Because his victims were prostitutes, it took four victims before the police really took it seriously. Prior to that, they were just, they were prostitutes and they probably got the wrong John or picked up the wrong client type thing. But then by number four, it was kind of like, hang on a minute, there's something not quite right here, something we need to think about here. Okay, so sometimes the police, by not recording and reporting and investigating the crime, they are denying the um, victim that label. They're, they're saying you're not worthy or you are not actually a victim um, because you don't deserve it or you, your crime's not worthy of having that label attached. So what is the impact of victimisation? And don't worry, you don't need to memorise all of these, you just need to be aware of them. So Hoyle in 2012 argued that when somebody is given the label of victim, it can have a very big impact on who they are. And this again, as I said, links into the idea of labeling theory. And victims of crime can suffer any number of these um, symptoms of these issues the anxiety, depression, withdrawal, panic, shock, PTSD, poor health, feelings of powerlessness, because being a victim of crime is the removal of control. Something has been done to you without your consent, whether that be somebody breaking into your home, which is considered a, a kind of sacred, safe place. It's somewhere you're supposed to be, think, um, warm bath theory with um, Parsons somebody breaks into your home it can ruin that sanctity it can ruin that sense of safety um, if you're a victim of a violent crime the, that sense of powerlessness the um, anger that you might feel that you allow that this happened to you or, and you may blame yourself for allowing it to happen because you weren't able to protect yourself so for Hoyle these impacts of victimization can be very impactful, especially if the label of victim is internalized and creates a master status, not necessarily self-fulfilling prophecy, but a master status. Walkley, if you remember from our talk about um, gender and crime, talks about double victimization and how there is within the criminal justice system there is a sense of victim blaming and this particularly happens in terms of rape trials in terms of sexual assault trials but we're seeing a growing trend in terms of honor crimes as well now this is a quite a culturally specific um crime where in certain cultures particularly in middle eastern cultures um a uh, indian cultures asian cultures where they are permitted to use quite extreme punishments on family members who bring dishonor on the family and um sometimes when with honor killings because it is an honor killing or an honor crime um they will say well they did this the victim did this the victim did that the victim did the other and push the blame of the crime onto the victim in the same way that we see with sex based crimes, where it's kind of like, what were you wearing? How much did you have to drink? Why were you in that area? Why were you on your own? Did you say no? Did you fight back? All of those sort of questions are trying to say to the victim, you are to blame for this crime occurring. You, you put yourself in that situation. You created the situation where this crime was able to occur and you didn't do anything about it. Um, so when people are victimised, not only 
by the criminal act, but also by the court cases that they then have to go through, this can lead to a huge fear of crime where people don't uh, worry more about something that hasn't happened than what has happened and they may become paranoid. Um, most people will fear being a, a victim of crime. Nobody wants to be a victim of crime and there may be situations where it's kind of like, mm, I'm not sure I want to do that because that could happen and that's not a good thing. Um, but the double victimization leads into that fear of crime because it's also it, particularly for women where it's kind of obviously nobody wants to be a victim of sexual assault and it's and women will go out of their way to minimize the risk of being a victim of sexual assault or sexual crime but then they're also worried that if you are a victim of sexual crime and i report it and i take it to the police and it goes to court i'm going to get blamed for this they're going to dig through my life and dig through my history and try and come up with reasons why I'm to blame or I'm lying or I'm not doing I'm um, I'm the one in the wrong. So a lot of women, um, according to studies, are not only worried about being the victim of crime. They're also worried about what would happen should a crime go to court, because some of those defense lawyers can be really harsh and, and quite abusive almost in trying to prove their client innocent or um, mitigating circumstances or um, reduce the uh, role that their client played in in the crime itself. So let's look at the explanations for victimization. What is it that leads people to becoming a victim of crime? Now, obviously, there is the non sociological arguments that they perhaps in the wrong time at the wrong place they haven't protected their home um and things like that but there is a psychology uh, it's not a psychology a sociology behind um what causes people to be victims of crime and they can be categorized into two main main groups the positivist victimology and critical or radical victimology so we're going to look at radical victimology or critical victimology first. And that is argued by Mulby and Walklate that oops, sorry, um, structural powerlessness is what they refer to it as, where social structures cause victimization. So as we've seen, somebody who is more likely to be a um victim is somebody who's in the working class and they can't afford the bars belts and barriers they can't afford the protections against criminal activity so structural powerlessness is the refer reference to the social structures which cause people to be victimized you then also got labeling theory it's the state that labels who is and who is not a victim through that police triage, through the denial or the attachment of the label of victim. So it, it, there is a structural process to that labeling system. It's not an individual choice. It is the, the institution of the criminal justice system through the, the media and um, the legal system to determine who is worthy of the term victim and who is not. And finally, they, Toombs and White talks about the hierarchy of victimization, which links in with the labeling in terms of to at what point do you become a victim? So they use the example of uh, health and safety and how somebody who is a victim of an accident at work or um, neglect at work which causes uh, injury or something like that they are considered quite low on the victim hierarchy because they can be passed off as clumsy workers the company has put in place health and safety issues so them they being a vic they, they become them hurting themselves at work doesn't make them a victim it makes them clumsy 
um, prostitutes are low on the hierarchy of victim, uh, victims because they put themselves in dangerous situations where um, they can become a victim of crime. Um, and oftentimes their crimes, uh, crimes against prostitutes, are dismissed as, well, you, you, you're a prostitute, you put yourself in that situation, so that's your fault, um, which is not right um, in any way, shape or form. But that's what they're talking about in terms of the hierarchy of victimization. You're more likely to become a victim and have that label of victim attached if you are middle class, white and female. And you want, if you put yourself in a situation where you could be um, a victim of crime, then that's your fault. So you move down the higher the victimization hierarchy and are less likely to have that label attached. Now, if we look at the evaluation of this explanation of um, victim victimology, um, it does ignore the role that the victim plays in their own victimization. It is deterministic. It's a it's saying that the whether or not you're a victim of crime is done to you. Now we talked earlier about labeling the negotiation process in terms of labeling and how some victims of crimes do say, I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. Um, but in order to have that negotiation process, somebody needs to apply the label of victim to them. And in certain situations that won't um, won't happen. Um, and what we're talking about here is not the fact that somebody's put themselves in a situation where they can become a victim of crime. It's about having that determination that you are a victim. Okay, so this is saying that whether or not you're a victim is external to you. It, you don't decide you are a victim of crime, the state decides, the um, hierarchy decides. Okay. It does, however, show us the social construction of victimhood, particularly labelling and Tombs and White's hierarchy of victimisation. It highlights how victimisation and the label of victim is a social construction and societies determine who is and who is not a victim. And finally, it reveals the role of the powerful in determining who is and who is not a victim. And this can link into the ideological state apparatus in terms of Marxism and moral entrepreneurs um, in terms of labeling and determining uh, who, is, who does and who does not get the label of victim. Now, positivist um, victimology is a little bit more personal. So they argue that there is, um, you've got Mears um, in 1989, who argues that um, attempts that, or Mears attempts to identify the factors which lead to patterns of victimization. Um, and he focuses particularly on interpersonal crimes, meaning those between individuals. So we're not talking about robbery or um, theft or breaking and entering and things like that. And he tries to find out the ways that um, victims have contributed to their own victimization. OK, so he talks about the three features of um, positivist victimology. He talks about victim proneness, victim and victim precipitation and typology of victim. So tyranny, oops, sorry, tyranny, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, talks specifically about victim proneness and victim precipitation. So when we're talking about victim proneness, what we're doing is identifying characteristics which make someone more likely to be a victim of crime. Now, as we've said before, we've looked at the statistics and if you are male between the ages of 19 and 28 and from an ethnic minority or a mixed ethnicity background, you are more likely to be a victim of crime. OK, 
but it's also people who are perhaps more vulnerable who um are perhaps a little less socially aware that might be more likely to be victims of crime victim precipitation is how victims have been actively involved in the crime or brought the crime upon themselves so we see this again in part in terms of um, sex crimes where they look at the situation that the victim put themselves in and how did they bring about their assault how did they bring about the crime happening to them maybe they were walking alone in a dark alley um drank too much alcohol at a party um dressed provocatively which is an awful um idea or it might be in terms of your housing and you went out and left the front door open or didn't lock your front door you didn't lock your car um you engaged in activities that could lead to you being a victim of crime maybe it was going drinking too much not necessarily in terms of a sex crime but then you get into a fight and things like that so positivist victimology is looking at how the victim brings about the um, crime on themselves and then you've got Hans um, von Hinting I think who talks about victim uh, typology and this is based on the degree to which victims contribute to causing the criminal act and he identified 13 characteristics of a victim including them being young female old immigrants depressed wanton quite like that word it's quite an old one wanton it's sexually provocative um a tormentor um or fight or being involved in fighting so these sort of characteristics this kind of typology is suggested that if you engage in these behaviors if you are within these any of these characteristics you are you must take some responsibility for your victimization you you need to take some responsibility for bringing that crime onto yourself now obviously the evaluation on this one you've got um it's completely ignoring the fact that some victims don't even know they're victims now they can't take the label of victim in this case but they're still a victim of a crime a crime has occurred and they have been victim they they're, they're the ones who had the crime done to them so even if they don't know it they have still perhaps been at a financial disadvantage because of or had an economic situation um occur because they've been a victim of crime you lose your wallet as we go back to our the losing of the wallet um scenario um that puts you at an economic disadvantage you've lost the money that was in that that wallet you've lost cash cards um and all of that so that can be considered that that's um even though it might be that you lost it you could have been a victim of a pickpocket so you're still a victim but you don't know whether you're actually a victim or not um it also ignores the wider structural causes of victimhood it places the blame for victimization and i think that's my last one as well yeah um it places the blame of victimization upon the individual you cause this to happen to yourself well it's not my fault that i'm working class or poor and can't afford to secure my home or um to to have the bars bolts and barriers that the middle classes have i can't get an alarm for my um house to stop someone burglarizing it um my my job pays me in cash so it means that i i have to walk around with once a week with a with a watch of cash in my wallet before i can get it into the bank um so it does ignore those wider social structures and it is very much as i've said victim blaming it's saying you are responsible for being a victim of crime okay so just to summarize victimology is looking at the trends in victimization across age class gender ethnicity and sexuality and it is also looking at the theories 
of or explanations of victimization in terms of positivism and and critical or radical victimization.